Welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, episode one, with Tim Ulmigan. Donny, I'm the host of the Free Dive Cafe, and together we're going to sit down and go really deep with some of the deepest humans on Earth. The Free Dive Cafe is long-form interviews that get into the backstories, the training, the challenges, the passions and fears, and personal philosophies of those who choose to adventure on one breath. Free Dive Cafe can be found at freedivecafe.com. All the episodes and show notes are there. And I'll eventually be adding more content there, like a blog, videos, and product reviews. You can listen to the podcast through iTunes, the Stitcher app, which is my favorite, and YouTube. If you would like to see it somewhere else, let me know. If you listen to the podcast and you really like it, please, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star review. It really helps increase the visibility of the podcast and makes it available to more people. If you're listening on YouTube, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a positive comment in the comment section. Go to the Facebook page and like that too. That's at facebook.com, Free Dive Cafe Podcast. If you have friends who love free diving, share the episodes with them on Facebook and Twitter, and let's really try to build a community around the podcast. I'm new to all of this, so if you have any comments, suggestions, or criticism, go to the website and leave a message through the contact page. Just take it easy on me. Do you really, really like the podcast and really appreciate what I'm trying to do here? It takes an enormous amount of time and effort to create and edit these podcast interviews. If you would like to say thanks and support me in this project, you may become a patron at patreon.com slash freedivecafe. You can support the podcast with as little as $1 per month. Why not make it $3 the price of a cup of coffee? Would you buy me a coffee if you met me in the cafe? You can go to patreon.com slash freedivecafe to do that. This was a quite a long interview and I think it really reflects the need for this podcast in the freediving community. The two or three minute segments that freediving usually gets in the media are just completely inadequate to discuss such topics as equalization, squeezing and competition safety, all of which we get deep into here. I made the decision to keep most of the interview intact and not shorten it too much. This is in part out of respect for Tim, and in part out of respect for you guys, the listeners. I'm just a conduit for this information, and ultimately I think you guys should shape the way the podcast works, and I look forward to hearing from you about that. I'm also using some very basic equipment, and I'm pushing it to get the best sound quality I can, but I still have a lot to learn. Please bear with me, and I'm sure there will be a lot of improvements over the coming weeks and months. Tim was on Skype from the Philippines, so we made the best of the situation with the barking dogs in the background and all. On today's episode, we have Tim Umagan. Tim began freediving in 2012 and has been a competitive freediver since 2014. He is an Ada Master instructor and in the past year has achieved four national records for Germany and currently holds the German record in constant weight, diving to 93 meters and also in constant weight no fins diving to 67 meters. The show notes for Tim's episode can be found at freedivecafe.com slash Tim. Okay, let's dive. So Tim, thank you very much. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, you're the first guest. It's pretty cool. So I'm really happy to yeah. uh, welcome you as the first guest. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Nice. So, how about we start with um, your first experience of uh, free diving? How did you How did you come to discover the world of free diving? Uh, basically, the first time I got in touch with free diving, it's very classic. I saw the movie uh, Le Grand Bleu, yeah. so the Big Blue, um, and that's the first time when I saw okay, somebody is holding their breath and then they go down and. Um, the second time when I really saw it live was when I did actually my open water in scuba diving in uh, Kotao. 
And the funny thing is our dive master said, yeah, that's free diving. So better not do it because you will, you will damage your ears. If you do it, you know, and it sounds like, okay, everybody's damaging their ears when they do it. So uh, I was kind of, okay, maybe not. But then um, there was two years later in 2012, there was somebody at the university uh, where I studied and there's like a sports program. And yeah, he was, uh, he was making like uh, courses. He was doing courses uh, for freediving, um, was an IDAR instructor. And then I said, okay, I will give it a go. And I went for my first uh, free diving course and it was really nice. And I liked it and I wanted to do more. So when you were younger, did you did you have any kind of athletic um, background in swimming or anything like that that would have helped you with uh, free diving? Uh, like I always like to hold my breath and to see how it works, you know. And then I got those funny contractions and it was like kind of, uh, kind of cool, you know. Or I can remember... Uh, uh, when I was quite young, I wanted to go down to the, to the bottom of the deepest pool where, you know, like where those, uh, those towers are in this, in, in the, you know, in those big swimming pools and, uh, it was like four or five meters deep and was happy to, to touch the, to touch the, the bottom. And, uh, that's something I liked a lot. Um, but there's nothing really particular, particularly. So I was not, um, I was not a swimmer or something. I was always good in swimming. In school swimming, I was always one of the best, but uh, it was not like something I, I really did in a club or so. When you first did that course, do you remember, or I mean, even in the early days of your free diving for the first year or so, was there anything that you found particularly challenging? It was very difficult for you, but you somehow overcame that challenge in time? Um, yes, I always had problems with equalization. So I was one of those unlucky people who could not equalize at first. And for me, it was very hard to go down. And I was actually uh, going feet first all the time. And then in the end, you know, there's some point of time you need to learn French. And I went to, to Dahab. Uh, and uh, Wendy Timmermans, uh, she was teaching me French. And that was like, that was very challenging because I really didn't know how to equalize. And as soon as I got it, it was like a kind of like a rebirth, you know, like I was really discovering free diving from a completely different angle. That was that was very good. I would say that was uh, that was the cha most challenging for learning free diving. Other than that, of course, there are a lot of challenges, but they come with the training, you know. Yeah, I think I think the equalization issue for sure is the most common problem that beginner free divers will have. And it's quite nice to hear you say that you had this problem too, because for me, it was also a big issue. Um, it even, it still is a big issue for me. So I hope that in time it will improve. Um, I'm sure it will. Yeah, for sure. I, I always tell the people everything is possible to learn. You know, there's, uh, um, free diving can be learned in every, in every term. You know, it's not like, uh, some people have more advantage than the other. Uh, I don't believe this. I think everybody can do it. Also on a competitive level, uh, it's just it's just about training, just about a lot of training, maybe. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it is also to do with the development of awareness. And in the beginning, we we might not have a very highly developed awareness of the tools that we need for free diving, but that is something that only time really can can allow us to develop. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you're you're teaching in uh, Pang Lao now in the Philippines. Is that correct? Um, yeah, mainly I'm training here, but uh, also teaching. There's like sometimes I teach more, sometimes I train more. But I'm I'm located in Panglao. That's correct. I saw a video clip of you online. Uh, you were doing Naoli and some yogic uh, practices. Could you talk a little about that? Um, just tell us how you use that in your training and how effective you think yoga is for free diving. Was it was it one of the German uh, TV? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a German I, language one. Yeah. yeah. So basically, yeah, I just showed them like the Udayana Banda, um, so where you uh, where you move your diaphragm. Um, I'm not doing any yoga, so I'm actually also not so super flexible. I would say I'm more of the unflexible people, in my opinion. Um, but uh, I use uh, Udayana Banda for sure for the contractions. So what I do is um, I just exhale as much as I can, go down and then move the diaphragm until I get the first contraction and then I slowly go up and then just let the contraction come. 
so that my my body and especially the diaphragm gets used to the contractions. I'm doing this I'm doing this before 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 diving for sure. But I'm I'm not doing any any other kind of yoga I would say. It's, that's that's the only one from the pranayama. I wish I can do more pranayama, you know, but it's uh it's not so easy when you're not experienced in this. Uh for sure it helps, for sure there are some benefits, but this one is more technically, so this one's more technical thing I'm 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 doing so that uh, I want to avoid um getting strong contractions in the depths. So when I get contractions they should be it should be like a gentle movement. The uh, diaphragm should be like jelly, you know. You think that Practicing Uddiyana Bandha and Nauli uh, allows you to soften the contractions. Yes, I, I personally believe for, for sure because when I when I do it the first time in the morning, it always feels a little bit stiff. When I do the second time, it gets better and better and better. You know, it's uh, I'm pretty sure that the muscle it gets more used to movements, and then when you get contractions, it's more it's more gentle. You know. I think even from my experience, it's funny you should say that because the last couple of weeks I did Nauli every morning and I also did a lot of regular CO2 tables and I found that my contractions were becoming easier and easier and gentler and gentler. So maybe it is the Nauli that is contributing to that. Yes, maybe. For sure, they all there are many contributing factors, you know, but this is maybe one which is nice. And it's not harming you, you know, like you're not doing any... any uh further exhale packs you're not doing any um uh, uh reverse packs i mean and you, you're not doing anything to your lungs really you're just moving the diaphragm and it's nice it fe- i think it feels good so training in pang lao can you maybe take us through like a day of training like um what does that look like for you basically in pang lao there are many places where you can freedive meanwhile, but uh, the place where I freedive is called uh, Freedive Pang Lao, so that's also the oldest school. And they just built a new dive center here. It's uh, very big. I, th- I think it's the biggest diving sc- uh, freediving school in the world. I don't know any bigger one. Like with a huge pool, accommodation, and so on. And it's like half owned from Korean, half owned from uh, from a German guy called Stefan Randig. And the Korean guy called Donga Kim, and uh, there's where I train. You know, we go out with a boat. That's maybe interesting to say because we are in the Philippines, as in most cases, or like in most places in Asia, you have a lot of currents. And uh, this place in the Philippines, Panglao, is, is quite nice. You don't have so much current like in other places. Um, but still, if you have a little bit of current, we are drifting on the uh, on the surface. So we're drifting with the boat, and even if you have a little bit of current, you will not feel it. So you can have a straight line, and you just go with the current. I would say like in maybe 10% of cases, it's it's bad conditions or not nice conditions. But other than that, we have really nice conditions to dive here. And um, basically, the, the training, it, it it works quite simple. You have many train many different trainings you can do. Uh, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of... Um, deep diving or adaptation training so i'm i'm going back to the to the deep diving i did a lot of cnf uh, in the last uh, in the last weeks also because i wanted to have the cnf uh, national record and um yeah so basically i'm doing a lot of deep dives then uh, sometimes in between there are more like technical training so i do repetitive dives and look on the technique for example one time i did uh, um I tried to make the way down a little bit harder with uh, no weight, uh, and so that the uh, that the uh, descent is more and more difficult for no fins. And um, I tried to train this, you know, before I go back to my normal weighting. And and you recently, uh, very recently, just attained the German national record for constant weight no fins. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I broke it uh, for sixty-seven meters. Uh, I needed to do, and I, I I did that dive. Next day, I wanted to do 69, but uh, yeah, my head was already it was kind of finished, you know. I, <laughs> the competition was finished, and I, the motivation was missing a little bit, you know. It was like ah, uh, and also on that day, the, com- uh, the the conditions were not really perfect, you know. But that's that would be a bad excuse. It would have still be possible, but I I was just not motivated. <laughs> well, congratulations in any case. It's uh, an absolutely outstanding dive. Uh, thank you. When you're training for depth, how often would you train a maximum a maximum depth dive? Would you do that once a day or even just a couple of times a week? 
No, once once a day, uh, maybe two days in a row, and then one one day off. Sometimes three days in a row, and one day off. It depends on how I feel, and it depends on how like yeah, how, how's the schedule? You know, like when is the competition and so on. So, but I would definitely just do one deep dive. It uh, sometimes depends a little bit what I'm doing. You know, in the beginning, often when I come somewhere and I I haven't been diving for like a month, I would maybe do two dives to set uh, to sixty meters. And uh, then after at least 65 meters, I would not do more than one dive. Uh, it's just uh, always a little bit risky for the ACS. And I'm taking this topic, uh, I would say, more or less serious. So I say, okay, after 65, there's no other uh, than one dive, one deep dive. So is CNF your favorite discipline? No, um, I have... I have a lot of favorite disciplines actually. I like I like actually all disciplines. I even like the I I like the bifins for example more than the monofin. <laughs> I found out and I like CNF, I like free immersion. There's always uh, you know pro and contrast with every, if, with each discipline. You know, you have the you have the CNF uh it's very nice because it's not so deep. So when you're used to dive deeper then it's like mentally easier, you know, you say okay, it's just one third of what you normally do. Maybe and if you uh, do free immersion, what is very nice is that the equalization is much easier when you go down. That's what I'm experiencing at the moment because now uh, yesterday and today I started with free immersion again, and I never had so easy uh, easy descents and so easy dives on the way down. It's uh, amazing how easy the equalization is all of a sudden because with constant weight no fin you are just moving more and uh, it's harder to 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 hold the contractions back to hold the urge to breathe back. It's uh, it's it's much harder to equalize, in my opinion, than um, than with the free immersion. Um, but again, on the other side, you don't need to take a big mouthfeel; just a small mouthfeel is enough to go to to one to two thirds of your normal uh, dive depth. So I think there's always uh, pros and cons, you know. And with the monofin, the same you you have much more speed, uh, much faster than the other disciplines, which can be really nice, uh, which gives you also a lot of confidence when you have a monofin on and you are uh at 90 meter for example in my case then it's easy you know for the mind because you say okay you have a lot of power you can go up no problem you know so it's always pros and cons maybe you know i didn't really find uh it easy to do static for static i didn't really had a nice training experience yet <laughs> yeah. i would say for me this is always very hard and uh it's it's like it's like torture yeah for you for you and many other people i think just on the topic of static, what is your static uh, personal best at the moment? Uh, it's six minutes eight, and I did it last year in January. <laughs> so like one and a half years ago. I would like to train it one time. Maybe I could do it to seven minutes. That would be nice. Yeah, but um, yeah, I'm just not really focused on that. Yeah, just uh, out of curiosity, because I think it's, uh, it's something that a lot of beginner freedivers want to know, because when most people start free diving and holding their breath, they can't hold their breath for very long. So can you remember what your breath hold was like in the beginning and how it improved over time? Did you all, did you start off at one minute or two minutes? I mean, how did it change over time? Why do you think it changed? I, I can still remember when I did my two star, I had a two star course. I had uh, three minutes, 18, I think. Yeah, that was that was like my first uh, serious breath hold attempt. You know? uh, of course, you you get you get much more relaxed. You get the techniques how to relax. You know, that's so. You know, often when people when I ask people like when does the dive start, they say like yeah, the dive starts when you do the duck dive. And I always say the dive starts at least uh, five minutes before or 10 minutes before the duck dive. And maybe some people would say it would even start uh, in the morning when you wake up, you know, because you need, you need to have the right mindset. You have to right you need to have the right relaxation. There's so much going on with uh, this topic to make you, um, to make you hold your breath longer. I'm absolutely convinced with this because I saw people not doing any hyperventilation, not doing any packing or something and they do seven, seven thirty minute breath holds, you know, and they say, yeah, they do it with, uh, hypnosis. So they are trying to relax so much that they're really feeling in a, in a, in a hypnosis, you know, and, uh, 
and then they can hold their breath much longer. So um, I believe those those things really matter. And uh, that's what every time what I tell my students, because uh, they say, oh, I had two minutes, that, that sounds a, a lot. And I say, I'm not surprised if you can do three minutes in the first attempt, you know. Ha happens many times. And some people come, they do their first attempt and they make four minutes, you know. So it's always... I think it's always about relaxation. It's always in every in every stage of the static also, you know, when the contraction comes, maybe some people like there's there's also a lot of discussion going on. There's some people can feel actually symptoms from uh, the dive response. So the vasoconstriction, for example, that you have the tingling sensation in your fingers and the head gets very warm. I feel that every time when I hold my breath, uh, maybe not in deep diving, but in, in, uh, in static. Absolutely. And I hate that feeling. And, you know, I talked to Vincent Mathieu, the French, uh, uh, really good French static uh, guy. And he said he loves that feeling. He loves it when he feels the vasoconstriction. He loves it. And that gives him more confidence. You know, I hate it. And when I get it, I get more unrelaxed, you know. So if you can manage, for example, those things, you can hold your breath much longer. I'm absolutely convinced. Yeah, it's amazing listening to different people's experiences, how much of a personal experience breath holding is and how different it is for for, for different people. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, it, absolutely, uh, relaxation is a major, major component of this. But I think there's also a side to it that we don't really know very much about yet concerning the science um, of what is happening at a, at a deeper level, a cellular le level, and how things like nutrition and uh, are, how things like nutrition and chemical exchanges in the body are also affecting how long we can hold our breath. So hopefully we'll find out a lot more about that in the future. I, yeah, exactly. Like there, there's still uh, some things which I would really like to know. I was just talking today with another free diver about that. When it comes to um, dynamic um, constant constant weights and constant weight no fins. What do you think the biggest differences are? Do you find them completely different disciplines? And was it very hard for you to dive no fins for the first time? What do you what do you think about that? No fins, no. Uh, it was I of course they they are very different. Um, I was always doing a lot of constant weights uh, until I found out that free immersion can also be really nice. And then at some point of time, I did no fins, and I checked out that fifty meters actually not so. Not so bad, not so not so difficult. And at some point of time, I was at 60, and then was the time when I was thinking about maybe the national record. And uh, yeah, it's of course it's 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 very different. For me personally, I have a I have some issues with the monofin. I I found out that my technique is not so nice as I thought, and maybe that also caused some problems on my dives. So. Um, Maybe for me personally, at the moment, um, no fins is is easier for me. You know? Coming back to training, outside of the water, do you do other kinds of um, training for free diving, such as weightlifting or you know things like CrossFit, high intensity interval training? What what kind of CO two training do you do? Do you do any other disciplines like that? Um, those those trainings they are usually this would usually be something um, um, which I would do when uh, before I go to a freediving place. So before I start my real depth training. Usually, especially like strength training is something um, I would say you should not really do when you are um, at the point when you're getting close to your PB because you need all the power for your for your deeper dives. It all it's 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 very different from person to person. So it's uh, I personally don't really feel so weak on certain disciplines, so I just go for it. And when I feel like I need to, to gain a little bit of power, I would do some workout. Um, what I'm doing at the moment, or like when, I, when I'm when i training the deep dive, and what I do a lot is uh, training on, um, on uh, visualization, on uh, mental aspects of the dive, trying to uh, relax under uncertain conditions so what i do now is like i do full exhale for example you get uh, the urge to breathe and the contractions much earlier and more intense and i try to relax i take a mouthfeel and then i really try to relax my shoulders my neck and um, try to 
blow out more or less the air from the mouth fill through my nose. I have a nose slip on, but I just attach it like uh, a little bit loose so that they can go some air outside. Maybe you can, maybe you know what I mean. It's a little bit hard to explain. And uh, try to 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 empty the mouth fill under those conditions. So you have like a like a empty lung or like a lung on residual volume. You get contractions, you get the urge to breathe, and you need to manage to to equalize. This is stuff I I, I do at the moment a lot. I will always do something. You know, when you do the deep dives, you know where are your problems. Maybe you can identify them on, are you getting hypoxic? Do you have uh, problems with the speed, for example? Like, is your dive time very slow? Do you have problems with the equalization? This is for many people the problem. They cannot equalize when they go deep. When they want to go deep, um, they lose the mouth fill. Um, and for me, for example, the biggest issue uh, why I need to stop um, at some point of time is the lungs, actually. So my lungs are easy to squeeze. I need to fix that problem. And um, I always have each time I do like a training period, I have a training period, try something new. So I try some some new aspects, which may correlate with the fact that I'm squeezing. And I change them, and then I go again in the water, and I, I check if this works or not. Uh, so what I'm doing at the moment is something which I try to do for the for the squeeze, so that I'm more relaxed underwater, that I don't do any mistakes, that maybe my equalization was wrong, so maybe the way I equalized was was contributing to the squeeze. So I'm changing that also. So this is something I would always do, try to analyze the problem and then do something dry, which would uh, benefit. So I, I understand that um, in competition, uh, you had a problem with the lung squeeze. Um, was that at Vertical Blue this year? That was at Vertical Blue, yeah. Yeah. So, and you say that you, when you say you have a problem with lung squeeze, it sounds like something that has happened to you more than once. More than once, of course, but it's not like uh, it's happened every, every time. I would stop free diving if it would be like this. So it's it's just uh, I had I had five squeezes in my life since uh, I think two and a half or three years. I think a lot of people, especially people who have no experience of lung squeezes, um, beginner free divers who have not quite got to that point where it might happen for them yet, they get very terrified even by the thought of something like that happening. What is it about your physiology? What do you think caused that for you? And what advice would you give to avoid that from happening? Uh, so first of all, I think you should not be afraid of it. You should respect it and you should, when you have it, you should do the right steps. That's very important. So whoever has it and, you know, the problem is you don't really feel pain in the most cases. Maybe you feel uncomfortable, but you don't feel pain. Maybe in the evening you feel as like, you want to dive the next day and that's very bad when you have uh when you have some kind of characteristic or personality which keeps you uh diving you know so this is this is the number one rule you know when you have it you need to take a break and you need to to see what you what you can do to make it better and the second rule is when you go back to the water take a lot of depth uh, away and uh, go very slowly you know so i saw cases i saw i saw a very bad squeeze case one time um somebody squeezed on 85 meters uh like a lung squeeze not not a not a n nice one it was it was a severe lung squeeze he took uh five days off and then he went back to the water and tried 90 meters 85 <laughs> was his pb and he took five meters on top 90 meters he squeezed so badly that he blacked out at 20 meters it was a very very bad accident actually you know it was you needed we needed to do uh, uh, cpr to get him back you know and it's uh it's it's uh you should never do something like this so number one rule is uh um take a break and the second rule is uh take uh go slowly back to your to your depths you know every time i squeeze for me it means okay even if i have now the time even if i have a month it will probably take me a month to go back to my pb you know i need to take at least a week off then I need to go back to the water. I need to feel very carefully what hap what's happening to my body when I come up. You know, you can feel the symptoms. And then you need to decide, do you go deeper or not, you know, and then go slowly. 
maybe two meters, two meters every time, and then that's okay. You know, I think as as long as you do it this way, squeeze will not be a dangerous thing in free diving. If you do it this way, you know, you can also you can have, buy an oximeter. You can measure the oxygen saturation every time. Go somewhere where you have oxygen, where you have uh, access to 100% oxygen. That's very important. So in case you are squeezing, you need 100% oxygen. If you take care of those things, it's it's still quite safe. It's no problem, you know. I, I always think like, okay, squeeze is more like an annoying thing because if you take the rule seriously, it means you cannot train, yeah. But I never consider it as something like, oh, the next time I go into water, I will I will maybe die or something, you know. Never, I would never think like this. Right. So, so it's not uh, something that has put you off uh, free diving for the rest of your life. No, not as as long as I'm not squeezing every time. I wouldn't. No, I would always try to figure out what um, what causes the problem. So you know, there are so many contributing factors, and I already thought about uh, because I'm I have a um, like a, a, a like an academic background. I'm uh, I did some in my in my I, I studied financial economics, and I did I did it in a theoretical way. So I went to a theoretical university and we did research and what you're using is like a lot of quantitative meta me methods to to uh to find out some you know to do empir empirical work you know but good empirical work and i tried to figure out how can you maybe find the real contributing factors for for squeezing and it's super hard it's like uh, something which is really really hard to find out um Something which I think, which uh, which really contributes, and it's it is something like which I would cause uh, I would call uh, uh, endogenousness. So it's something which is not really explaining a lot, but you can see it is if people are a lot in the water and if people are growing up um, at a place where they are a lot in the water, they suffer less from squeezes than uh, people who didn't really went to the water, didn't really go to the water, you know. And they start free diving and they are skyrocketing, you know, like until 70 meters, maybe in two years or something. And then they squeeze, you know, and those are the typical squeeze cases. So I'm, I'm actually the same case. You know, I went quite fast and uh, I squeeze. I think this is really contributing. So I would always say, take your time, have the patience, take it serious, go back and work on it again. And you will find a solution. If you are not patient, maybe you will even make it worse and you damage your lungs so much and maybe on a, sp a particular uh, particular point that you um, cannot really uh, recover from that so this is uh, this is always something i would i would say which is true about squeezes and then of course you have always like some contributing factors for example like how is your turn how is your movement underwater uh, how do you equalize? There are ways you, you could equalize. Maybe you don't recognize it, but your neck and your shoulders are completely tense and you don't know it, you know, and uh, maybe you need to change that. Yeah. So maybe also then at the same point of time, you have narcosis maybe. So you don't really remember what you were doing. So I had uh, like uh, two months before Vertigo Blue, I had another lung squeeze. So those were actually my only real lung squeezes. Um, the squeezes I had before were in the trachea. And lung squeezes, I had one in February, at end of February, and one in Vertigo Blue. The first one I had, I, I really don't know what I did wrong. And the problem is, you know, then, then uh, another freediver, uh, Andrei Mabenko, a Russian guy, he asked me, do you really remember what you did? And I said, actually, I had narcosis, you know. And then he said, like, well, maybe you don't remember what you really did, you know. So, and then I was thinking back, you know, like trying to really think about what I did. And actually, I found out, okay. My contractions were quite strong. So my first contraction, I was so relaxed on the way up. So my first contraction was completely uncontrolled. It was like a like a hiccup, you know. So um, so maybe it took you by surprise a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And maybe that caused the squeeze. So what I'm focusing now, for example, is when I feel the contractions are coming, you know, be really concentrated. Try to make the first contraction be really gentle, you know. Also, the packing is for sure a contributing factor because you come up and you have a you have a packed lung, and uh, the the pressure, the overpressure of your lung, you know, it, the lung is extending so fast in the last meters, and at the same time you have the blood shift. So ex at the same time you don't have the same volume as you had before. So if you can do dry, if you can do ten packs, for example, you shouldn't do the ten packs in the water. You should do maybe five packs maximum. Yeah, so. This is, for example, also something I found out. I, I tried to reduce packing 
um, to a minimum, you know. So if, if there is no problem with hypoxia, if there's no problem with equalization, I try not to pack any more, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are many people in the freediving community today who are even suggesting that packing is on the way out and that it shouldn't be taught or suggested to people and is not necessary. What do you think about that? It is the same it is the same thing as mouthfeel, it is the same thing as hyperventilation. Yeah, so especially with hyperventilation, maybe you will make yourself very unpopular <laughs> when you talk about this. But if you look if you look carefully, you know, many competitive freedivers, they use some form of hyperventilation. Maybe not really the classic hyperventilation which you can see in uh, in the big blue, you know, like oh how the people did it uh, in the eighties and the nineties. It it will be something else, you know, it will be like maybe uh long exhales like a, or stronger exhales um you know and you always need to think about you need the experience and it's a it's a it can be some kind of tool but you need the experience to know what your body can take and what not i already had in hyperventilation i had i had a dive where i did unconscious hyperventilation and i had all the symptoms i had no contraction at all and i came up and i had a i had a two seconds blackout you know so of course we we know all of this. We know also that the packing can be um, very dangerous. But you know if you if you use it a little bit, if you don't use it too much, um, I think it's it's okay. Um, I think the right uh, way to think about it is don't use it for equalization. So if equalization is an issue, maybe you should not take the packing. To make the equalization easier, so it means if you do what if you do packing, you can take a deeper mouthfeel, you can equalize easier when you are in depth, but um, it will not help you so much. We teach that also in the four star course. We teach exactly this. Yeah, the packing it will not help you as much as your uh, uh, your uh, flexibility. If you have a good residual volume, it help, will help you more. I would always teach, or I would always say, packing should not be like a substitute to make the equalization easier better is to work on the on the on the technique better is to work on the flexibility uh, so this is for this is for packing in my in my opinion maybe with the reverse packing something like this can be helpful uh, for stretching um, but it's the same thing you know you need to be very careful you need to do baby steps when you start with this you should start at the right point maybe you shouldn't start when you are like 30 meters uh, diver you maybe should start when you are really see this as a useful tool um, another controversial thing as well as the mouth fill possibly many people uh, some people think it's being taught too early to many people because they should first see how far they can get with their residual volume first before they employ the mouth fill yeah it's absolutely true it's um I mean, if you, it's, it always depends on the teacher, you know, if a, if a teacher comes and says, yeah, mouthfeel is a great thing, try it. It's, it's so easy to equalize. It's a bad thing, <laughs> you know, like, uh, but if somebody comes and says, okay, you need to do the mouthfeel in the right way. If you perform it in the right way, it will benefit. It will maybe also be safer to dive this way, you know, maybe somebody is wrestling and, uh, starts pushing you know but maybe if he does a mini mouth fill and uh, keeps falling 10 more meters and is more relaxed because he has a full mouth with air and he has no problems to keep the epiglottis closed uh, or the glottis closed it's called glottis right um, so then uh, it would be uh, it would be okay you know so it always depends and um, I would say the mouth fill is a very strong tool but it is something which takes a long time to improve it. And in my opinion, there is no point where you say it's perfect. There's always something to improve every time. What is also interesting is, is something which, uh, which, uh, is not, te not taught so much is, um, that the, that the mouthfeel, you can do it in a different way. You can make a, you know, you can make a co constant pressure and you can keep the, 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 the esthesian tubes open. Or you can really gently push with your tongue. And that's, for example, also something I'm doing at the moment. I, I was always doing a constant pressure because it's, it's easier to, 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 uh, to manage or it's easier to not lose the mouthfeel and to go deep. But at the same time, uh, maybe exactly when I do this constant pressure, maybe my, my, my relaxation suffers. So at the moment, I'm training on just gently push with the tongue each time and uh, pop up the, the esthesian tubes. And uh, this can be also something which 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 helps. You know? 
Have you ever had another uh, bad accident or a scary experience or seen someone else having a bad accident in the water? So I, for, for myself, I never had a bad accident. I had, I had some, some squeezes, as I said before, but I always have been quite uh, conservative with it. I always stopped diving. Um, I had uh, like some mild hypoxia when I was in the pool. I had one, one case where I did unconscious hyperventilation and I did 57 meters no fins and I didn't have one contraction the whole way. <laughs> And uh, I had like a mini blackout and a dip in that moment, so I was disqualified also. So it was a, it was actually like a blackout, but I don't really consider it as a blackout because you know I was it was not because of oxygen related problem. It was a it was a hyperventilation problem. No, I never had an accident. I'm I'm always very careful. I always look at the rope very carefully. How is the rope behaving? You know, sometimes you can see if you have deep current or if you have surface cover, current. But I saw accidents for sure, yeah. I had uh, um, four cases, I would say, where I think that was a good experience to see. And there was one very severe case uh, last year at the competition in January uh, where a diver um, went down CNF, uh, constant weight no fin, and she was not practicing no fin a lot. So she... Uh, um she had problems to go down she had problems on the on the descent and uh so her coach which was a very bad advice i need to say said like yeah let's take more weight and for her more weight was like switching from two kilo to five kilo of weight <laughs> so she basically did a duck dive and she was sinking like a stone and of course you know the the, the math is very easy if you cannot go with two kilos to the free fall you will not go with five kilos the way up, you know. So she was going down. It was it was not a deep dive. It was just uh, it was not even 30 meters, but she couldn't come up. And she blacked out at, at 30 meters, uh, 28 meters, and they needed to activate the counter ballast, uh, uh, the counter weight. So uh, and she had because of this, she had like a lot of uh, water in her lungs, and it took I think around six to seven minutes. Uh, till she was back i was uh, i was helping a little bit uh, to to you know to i was lifting her up i was getting her to the boat luckily there was a there was you know because the, the of course you always try to get a good good doctor but uh it's it's sometimes very hard to get a to get a really good doctor you know and luckily there was a there was a good nurse on that on that boat she was uh she was from france she was actually just uh, um, visiting the place, you know, and just spectating. And she was an emergency, emergency uh, a nurse, and she definitely saved her life, you know. So she really needed, she really knew what to do, you know. She tilted her head back, and she knew, okay, there's no chance to give her oxygen because there's just too much uh, water inside her lungs. And I, I definitely thought she was dead. So I was like, oh my god, she's dead. I was so shocked. I, I had like a, I had a complete shock moment, you know. Uh, and uh, as soon as she started breathing again, you know, I was so happy. And uh, at that point of time, I really thought, okay, like, you really need to think what you're doing, you know. You can do free diving and you can make it in a safe way. And I always tell the people, I always tell my, you know, my parents and I always tell people when they say like, oh, isn't it dangerous? And I always tell the media, especially, uh, you know, like fr free diving is dangerous when you don't uh, take care of the safety but if there if there are safety standards and if you take them serious um free diving is a very safe sport actually you know like if you if you just do what you what you do and if you're conservative so if you see uh, today very bad conditions maybe don't do your pb you know maybe do a little bit shallower dive it's still a good training um if you always go this way, it can. I don't think that free diving is a dangerous sport, you know. Yeah, it's, it's terrible that these things happen sometimes, but we need them to happen too, so that we can learn from them. To suggest that free diving is uh, an incredibly dangerous sport, I mean, it's um, compared to other so-called extreme sports, it's it's really not that dangerous. Yeah, even even to even to very established sports, you know, like look at snowboarding. Snowboarding is much more dangerous because you have the you have the uh, thing with the speed. You know, you have like a lot of speed. You have maybe somebody who's not really controlled and like some some beginner. Uh, um, it's the same thing, you know. Like uh, you shouldn't do that, but you also have some safety standards. You know, you shouldn't go to a. Um, I, I I forgot how to how to say it in English. You know, to a to a black. Uh, road or to a black path you know like the, the ones where you shouldn't where you shouldn't go 
because of because of uh, um, yeah those particular slopes that you uh, that are not controlled exactly yeah but where where nobody can say they're safe so if you do this this is the same thing like if you if you free dive by your own if you free dive alone you know like uh it's it's always the thing you know if you free dive alone and you um like you know 99 percent of of the of the accidents which happen and people die it's because they're diving alone right so i think the uh or without a lanyard uh, i think the, the 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 thing is very easy as as long as you don't do this you know not diving alone and diving with a lanyard it's not difficult, you know. It's not it's not changing anything on your dive really. Mm-hmm. And as long as you're not, uh, as long as you're respecting this, and as long as you take those um, safety standards serious, uh, seriously, then it's uh, it's no problem at all, you know. Like uh, you 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 take so much risk out of the out of the free diving. Um, if you if you dive alone and you you have a blackout, in ninety nine point nine percent of cases you will die. But if you um, if you dive with a buddy, and even if it's not really an experienced one, and you come up and you have a blackout, you know, you will survive in ninety nine point nine nine percent of the cases, you know. So, I think that math is very easy, and uh, as long as you take it serious, it's not an extreme sport, in my opinion. In my opinion, the the the, the, the definition of an extreme sport means that you go into an environment which is not controlled. Even if you like to control it, you cannot control it. So the only thing in freediving which is not controllable is um, that it's an outdoor sport and you are in the water and maybe there is something which can come like an like an uh, like a risk which you could not see before you know for example like a ghost line this is like the most most terrible thing I can I can think of a ghost line you 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 go down and at 80 meter you get stuck with the lanyard you know. But still, you know, it's like a, it's a risk, but uh, you should always be aware of it. So I, what I, for example, always think, I have a protocol for this. You know, I know I take five seconds, try to get entangled somehow, and after five seconds, I take, I take off the lanyard. You know, um, I need to take this, I need to do this protocol because I know if I have narcosis, maybe, uh, maybe I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm, I'm practicing actually something like this. You know, so that even with, even when I have narcosis. I will be a little bit more controlled about what I need to do. So um, those things, I would say, maybe those are a little bit extreme. But if you are in a controlled environment, um, then it's not an extreme sport, in my opinion. Right, and I think that in free diving, in a sense, the environment is actually very controlled because, especially in competition, because you always have several people who are looking at you from the surface several people who are diving with you on the ascent and you have a, a very small environment that you're actually working inside of which is defined by the, the by the rope by the line so it's actually quite a controlled environment um absolutely true exactly and that's why i my personal uh, opinion and my uh view on this is that when i go from training to a competition i feel more relaxed because i know there are many more people watching at me and I, I always see it this way, you know, I pay a lot of money, I go there and I, I pay this money for 10 minutes of full uh, control, you know. So I know in those 10 minutes, I'm going into the competition zone and I'm the one who everybody has the attention on, you know. So um, I, I'm having all the attention, you know, of all the people. So I'm saying, okay, I, I pay this money for this. So let's do my best, and this really relaxes me. You know, this is this is my mindset when I when I go into the competition zone. Maybe it's it sounds a little bit strange, you know, but I always say okay that, and that's always why I I, I when I feel good and when the training was okay, I always announce PB in, in the in the in the competition because I say okay here I will feel more relaxed than 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 in any other training for sure. Maybe a little bit nervous, you know, maybe a little bit nervous, but there are techniques to 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 overcome this, you know. So in comp- competition is actually, in, in a sense, the most uh, safe environment that you can be in when you're trying for a personal best or diving really deeply. It should be. Um, I mean, there have been some uh, some some mistakes in the past, uh, especially the World Championships in, the, in Kalamata and in uh, in Cyprus. Um, of course, those accidents or those mistakes should never happen. Um, and this is always why when I go to a competition. I always control. I always, I always control the line. I want to see everything. I want to know a lot of stuff, you know. Um, and I always tell my opinion. If I see something is not good, and I see, okay, you know, those mistakes, they, they always happen because of, 
bad communication and bad organization, you know, and not really because uh, someone had a lack of experience or something, you know. So if those mistakes don't happen, you know, then it would be nice. But uh, yeah, but other than that, you know, like uh, if, if it's if it's concerning a blackout or if it's concerning uh, maybe a squeeze, you know, because you have medics there, they can they can look at you. You are more controlled, even when you really want to dive. There's somebody saying, no, you can't. You know that that is how it was in, in Vertigo Blue. You know, I needed to do three days off. That's that was the rule. I couldn't say I don't want to. And uh, after that, I needed to discuss my my uh, my performances. I needed to discuss with the judges and with uh, with the medics. You know, I couldn't just announce whatever I like. And it was a very long and very intense discussion because my lung squeeze was not, uh, not uh, like not a not a small one, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, and that's very good, you know. You have you have controlling parts in the competition which you don't have in the training. In training, you can ever you can do whatever you like, and maybe you have a buddy who is telling you, "Oh, that's not a good idea." If you have a good buddy, yeah. So, so you've said before that you're especially passionate about uh, competition free diving. What is it about competition that you like so much? Oh, it's uh, challenging for sure. It's interesting that the question is interesting, you know, because you can also do those those steps in in um, in, uh, in the training. You know, sometimes of course the record system how it works, it gives incentives, and it's nice to to have a ranking, and it's nice to to see this, and you know. Um, this is like some kind of an achievement, you know. You, you you do a dive in a competition, and then you see, okay, you you're getting you're getting close to maybe the top thirty in the world, you know, um, and that's something which which makes you proud, you know. So maybe this is this is the this is the thing. What personally, like when it this is the thing when it comes to my own performance, or when I say, okay, why do I go to competition for the dives? But, you know, the really nice thing about competitions is also, especially when you go to bigger ones like the World Championships or like Vertigo Blue, especially in Vertigo Blue, it was the case, is you take so many more experiences with you. You you, you talk to so many other people, to so many other deep divers. Uh, you know, you, you get to know them. There are so many kind people in, in the free diving world. And there's so many interesting other ways to dive, you know. Like, just compare... Uh, Alexei Molchanov and William Trubich, both are world-class freedivers, but they have different approaches to freediving, and they are diving in a different way. And uh, it's really interesting to see this, and it's really interesting to listen to them when they when they tell you something, or um, yeah, to see how they dive actually. And this is something which uh, you should always take with you on competitions. You go there, you think you have a lot of experience, but actually your experience level is still uh, not full at all you know you, you, there's so many things you can learn and that's always you sh- something you take you should take with you when you when you when the f- competition is finished yeah and from from the perspective of uh, an instructor what do you think are the biggest mistakes that uh, beginning free divers make the biggest mistake is <laughs> like that always depends on so on the instructor what is the most annoying thing but for me personally the most annoying thing is when uh uh, the beginners go down and they look up. Yeah, they they tilt back their head. They want to see where they are diving and they want to look at the tennis ball. And uh, I think, like in my case, like fifty percent of the of the students, it's very hard to teach them to to not look up. Just look at the rope, be relaxed. Especially when they have issues with the equalization, it's so much harder to equalize when they tilt back their head instead of uh, keeping it straight and just look at the rope. You know. Um, and I would say they do it because they're not relaxed. They they are uh, kind of, um, you know, like, uh, how do you say, like, um, distracted by other things. You know, maybe there is a boat running by and it's loud underwater. Or what is, for example, in the lake, what you can see many times is uh, you have a thermocline. I was teaching also in the lake. And you have a thermocline at around 12 meter, for example. And the diver is going down and at 12 meter, he turns or she turns again. And it's always then, then then they come up and they say like oh I couldn't equalize anymore and I say yeah actually I think the thermocline scared you uh, really there was a thermocline uh, yeah didn't you feel it was co- getting cold and oh yes and then you know okay the student was definitely distracted you know like there was no relaxation so there was no attention to what is going on uh, like uh, around you you know or what are the important things which are going on around you 
So I don't know. When I hit the thermocline, I always think, okay, that's cooler, a cooler water. It will be nice when I come back up. I know where I am, you know. So that's what I'm thinking when I touch the thermocline. I don't really think about it anymore. Oh, oh, cold water. I need to turn, you know. So um, I think this is this is often the I would say the biggest mistake from beginners, like um, problems with the relaxation and problems with paying attention on the right things. I think the problem is that there's just so many factors for a beginning freediver that are, are are very unusual yes hanging exactly. upside down even if you're in 300 meters of water as you go down you kind of have the sense that maybe you're going to hit your head on something and uh the environment is completely exactly. alien right yeah i mean i mean that the best what you can do as an instructor is always to go very slowly and try to do the easiest things first so first start with free immersion you know like just pulling you down and just don't talk too much about uh, uh, about your body position or something. I just want to see somebody going down and equalize. You know, just that put the line, put the the, the 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 weight or the line on eight meters. You know, so for most people, when they see eight meters, they think like, oh, that's not so deep. You know, so um, then it gives the students more confidence. And then when they do the the free immersion and the body position is okay, you know, I let them uh, do two meters free immersion and then I said, okay, kick down to ten meters. But the first two meters, you do free immersion, so there's no duck dive first. And then I introduce the duck dive. So then and you have everything, right? Then you have the duck dive, you have the fin kicking, and you have the equalization. And those is diffi- this, this is mo- mostly difficult because so many things at the same time you need to do, as you said. And um, But I think the best you can do as an instructor is just go step by step. So let's talk a little bit about uh, equipment. Like, Do you have any uh, any gear that you really like? Uh, that's hard to say. <laughs> it's funny. I, I think the nose clip is an inst- interesting equipment because everybody's talking about nose clips, and it's kind of kind of the um, equipment which is like you know everybody is talking about it, and you really need to have the right nose clip somehow. Uh, it's interesting. I will do soon. Uh, uh, me and Alenka Artnik, we want to do a, a nose clip test. So like a really professional, nice nose clip test to see the pros and cons of each nose clip. Um, and we want to, 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 to do that. So I would say like, yeah, maybe the nose clip is my favorite equipment. Uh, the lanyard for sure is a, is a very important equipment for me. I'm using, uh, like free experience, uh, uh, lanyards. I think they're very nice. They are, you don't feel the lanyard at all. You know, you, you, you also they have only Velcro system. I don't like those, those shackles, those pull shackles, which you, you know, because they can they can accidentally open. So I like the the the, the systems where you pull the velcro. And he has a uh, Kimo Latinen. He 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 introduced a very nice uh, lanyard with a with a belt, a belt lanyard with with velcro system. So you can you don't need this shackle. So that's that's very nice. And uh, I did a uh, test on the counterweight, and it's super nice when you sit there and you you know the counterweight gets executed and I'm having like an embryo position. Like uh, like you're sitting in a in a in a very comfortable chair, and uh, that's the best position you can have when the counterweight is 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 uh, is executed. And I always thought like if you have a belt landing, you would get tilted back, you know. But if you have a strap between your between your legs, it's it's absolutely fine. It's really nice, you know. Um, so I would say the lanyard and the and the no slip. Um, of course, the fins, they play a very important role. Fins are completely different, uh, especially monofins are completely different. Um, I switched my monofins now. I go from, from, I went from, uh, from stiff fins before I was using always, uh, glide fin. Uh, glide fin, I think is, uh, uh, definitely for free diving. I cannot imagine that glide fin is a good fin, <laughs> maybe for dynamic. Um, but uh, it's such a hard fin, you know. You need to kick quite a lot, but you have a lot. It has a lot of power, and I'm I'm going much more to to much softer blades now and to much softer fins. So I, I was using a power fin for quite a long time now, but it's also it was also quite stiff in the end. You know, it's more like a fin swimmer uh, fin maybe. And uh, now I'm I was just buying. Um, I was just buying the fin from Alexei, from Alexei Molchinov, uh, the, actually his fin, which he was using in Bahamas. So I'm trying to get used to that fin. And it's very soft, you know, it's like for deep diving, you go down and you feel like you are doing static, you know, if you have a nice technique, uh, which I don't have. <laughs> so I need to, uh, I need to improve my technique for sure. Because if you have a different monofin, 
your technique will be different after some point of time. And then, of course, uh, the very important equipment is the, is the wetsuit. So there's a huge difference which kind of wetsuit you have, especially when you do no fins. You cannot just take the same suit you're doing, you know. Like for example, if you have a three millimeter on all the time, Yamamoto, and you're diving uh, no fins all of a sudden, it's like it's like suicide, you know. You're going down and it's so hard to to go to the neutral point. And then probably will take also more weight. Uh, and then at the same time, you're sinking like a stone and then you can, you cannot come back up so easily. So because of the compression, you know, like at the beginning, it's very fluffy. So you have a lot of buoyancy. And when you go down, uh, it compresses a lot, the neoprene, and then you sink like a stone. If you do constant weight or if you do free immersion, this doesn't really matter so much because you can pull the rope. You have a lot of power with the monofin, but in constant weight, no fin, every, every single, uh, stroke counts yeah so this is for example something very important i noticed this time when i did the the, the constant weight no fin how much detail is in the correct weight concerning to your suit you're wearing so i of course i'm wearing the fit a, a very fin suit like a 1.5 mil some people they even use like a triathlon suit and have a swimming uh swimming cap on this is the best way you can do the the no fins and then uh on the way up i i was always using 1.3 kilo um, for no fins and I noticed that uh, like I was doing some training before like without any weight at all I was doing like 55 meter without any weight to make the the, the the way down much harder you know to make it more harder for myself but I'm on shallower depth on a shallower dive um, so what I did then I did I took my normal 1.3 kilo and I noticed and on the way up of course it's much harder it's much more work but I also noticed that when I do the leg uh, kick that I'm not gliding at all. So I need the leg kick and the arm stroke to start gliding. And then I said, okay, let's take a little bit weight off. And I took 900 gram and it was much easier. You know, that those 400 gram played such a huge role. It was a big difference, you know, like you do, you do the leg, stro uh, the, the leg kick and I could feel the glide on the leg kick, like, like I'm doing in the, in the dynamic northern, you know, you do the leg kick, you go forward, wait a little bit, and then you do the arm stroke. And that's perfect, you know, so that's how it should be. Uh, I noticed, okay, those, I needed to do a difference with the equipment and it was a difference in my diving for sure. And, um, yeah, I, I would say that's, that's, that's quite important. And, uh, now I'm using, I was always diving with Elios, Elios wetsuits. I had, I think I have six or seven Elios and now I'm using, uh, Oceaner, uh, wetsuits. They're really nice. You know, they're like, uh, they have a very nice, uh, very nice fitting. So it's like, like the arms and the legs it's there's definitely no water coming inside um and they have super nice designs you know so you can combine the colors so i really like uh for example i really like purple and i'm uh like i think i'm i'm one of very few men who are yeah. wearing uh, men, men who are wearing purple purple wetsuits uh, so yeah. I, I, I yeah and i uh i didn't really want to have like a full purple wetsuit i thought maybe that's too much you know so i said okay maybe i I can ask Oceaner, you know, because they can they can combine the colors and I said uh, black and uh, purple looks really nice and I tried it and actually it looks really nice. You know? Yeah, I've so seen I mean, it. It looks very nice. Yeah, it's a beautiful wetsuit. It's not bad and doesn't look too 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 feminine, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's 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 cool, you know. It's a it's a very nice wetsuit for sure. And do you have any experience with uh, when you when you dive with the nose clip, you dive without goggles, or do you have any experience with? Um, Fluid goggles? No, I, I hate fluid goggles. I don't like them at all. They're distracting me completely. When I take them on uh, on the surface, you know, it always reminds me of uh, when I was young and I was going to school and they gave us those those um, those goggles or, you know, those uh, glasses, which makes you look like you're drunk, you know, because, you know, they, they say, okay, when you have this glass on, then you know how it is when you drink alcohol. So never drink too much, you know, before you turn 16 or 18 or whatever the, to prevent. Uh, that's always the feeling what, what I have when I have uh, flute goggles, you know, like I feel like I'm drunk. Uh, I don't like that feeling at all. And I, I really don't see a point in it. I don't really think I need it. Maybe in Vertigo Blue, it would have been not so bad to have it. Because if you, you know, I, I always, I, when I went to Vertigo Blue, I thought the darkness will not be a problem for me because I was learning through diving in the lake. 
and I like it gets super dark, you know, at 40 meters, it's like completely dark. And I thought I wouldn't have any problem at all. Uh, but I had actually, because I noticed, oh, in the blue hole, I'm diving without a mask. So in the lake, I was diving with a mask and I could at least see a little bit of the rope. You know, you have an orientation somehow. And uh, when you are going to the blue hole and you are going so deep that it's like pitch black, you don't see anything at all. Um, you won't see the rope. You don't have any orientation. So that was that was my problem in, in uh, on my um, on my dive where I squeezed. I was actually I was uh, you could see it on the bottom cam. I uh, I got tangled with my lanyard on on the torch. I had a torch on my on my head. And I got uh, with the torch. I could had an orientation. You know, you could see a little bit, but it needed to be the right angle. So the torch need to 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 point to the right angle. And um, I was I was and I was tangled with the lanyard on my torch. So it was not a big deal. So, but I just needed to to turn around my arm. You know, so I needed to do like a loop around. And I was uh, like the, the the torch was was going away, or that the angle was different. And I lost orientation completely. I, you could see on the on the bottom cam, I was I was nearly going dynamic. You know, I was pulling the rope, uh, and I, I noticed in the dive I was pulling the rope. So I I kind of find the orientation. And when I was back to 75, 70 meters, like I could start seeing the rope, and then everything was fine. But the first 15 meters was completely uncontrolled, completely uncontrolled. You know, I I couldn't see anything. And um, maybe there, if you have goggles, maybe it's not bad. You know, but. Like where I'm diving here in Pang Lao, it's like uh, at 100 meters, it looks exactly the same like it looks at five meters. <laughs> it's uh, there's no difference in the in the in the uh, like it's it's the same brightness, you know. So for me, it's absolutely no problem to dive without goggles. It irritates me more, and also, of course, you have one more additional equipment you have to take off for the protocol. So there's always the thing with the goggles. So yeah, I hear uh, Pang Lao is an absolutely beautiful place to dive. Um, I have a few friends who have been diving there and training there. Do you have any other uh, favorite dive sites around the world? Like, what is your favorite place to dive? Oh, there are so many nice places, and every every place has a, a like a like a pro and a con. I would say um, there is no perfect place for. I didn't find a perfect place yet. I heard that Dominica should be near perfect. <laughs> I, so I need to check that out. So uh, maybe it is really perfect. Um, because, for example, you know, like Vertigo Blue, like the, the Dean's Blue Hole, it's an amazing place. It's so nice, you know, like it's no current, no, like you have unlimited depth. Uh, you have uh, more or less good water temperature, so you can dive in a 1.5. We had very bad luck, like when we were there, like the conditions were not nice and it was very cold uh, but it, that's unusual uh, concerning William so I trust him so normally the water temperature should be better but you have the darkness you know so it can freak you out it can make you feel uncomfortable I'm sure the next time I go to Vertigo Blue it will be much better for me because I'm, I am I know what, what, it, what, I'm, what I will be facing you know then you have Kalamata Kalamata is so nice it's so calm you know like uh, Stavros he's not saying uh there's a reason why he calls it the calm zone, you know, because you go there and it's super relaxed, you know. But at the same time, you have the thermoclines. Uh, you have a thermocline at around 60 meters and it gets uh, it gets freaking cold, you know, like you're diving in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. So you have to dive with a three millimeter. It's not easy to, to – it's always easier to dive with a, with a thinner suit, you know. Then you have Dahab, you have the you have the blue hole there. It's perfect, but you have only I say only 90 meters more or less, yeah. So if you want to dive deeper, uh, maybe it's not so nice. So I, I plan, for example, I, I would plan to go there if I want to do some serious no fins training. I think it's perfect because it's a it's a it's a, at least in the warm in the warm season. So in um, like in July, August, September. Yeah, that's and always what what is what is always an, a very important point is the location where you are. Uh, is it nice to be there for a long time? So for me personally, I couldn't be in Dahab for a year. Uh, it would be too much, you know. Like there's nothing going on there. Um, you see the same people more or less. Okay, they're there every time. Not more people coming that's not that's not true yet. so it's okay but it's uh also the nutrition for me personally it would be not so nice there there's a there's a nice nice restaurant called red cat you know you can have healthy food 
but uh, it's it's hard if you want to provide for yourself right yeah so to eat at the same restaurant every day for a year might take its toll eventually yeah exactly so for example in panglao you have you have amazing fruits it's it's just you know like the pineapple you can buy here i mean you know fuck all pineapple you have in germany you know <laughs> they 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 don't taste the same like here it's like amazing and the mangoes you know and they 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 cost nothing it, now it's mango season you know you get like a kilo of mango for uh, for like around 70 peso that's like around 1 euro 1 euro 30 yeah like yeah. a kilo you know like four mangoes or something it's yeah it's i know I, I live really in taiwan good. and I've, I've also we have that situation here in the south of taiwan that these amazing tropical fruits like mango and papaya and pineapple are abundant here and they cost almost nothing when they're in season you know like huge big avocados and things like that and i'm i'm plant-based i'm fully vegan so for me, this is a kind of a paradise uh, in that regards, which actually yeah. brings me to another point I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, your nutrition. Do you have any like uh, like special nutritional uh, protocols because of your free diving, or do you just eat pretty much what you what you like? Uh, I think I would. I'm more or less the semi thing, you know, like something in between. <laughs> so I, I had already the experience. I was really focusing on the nutrition. I was really eating, like I had a, a real nutrition plan, you know, like, and I was eating exactly the same things every day, more or less. Uh, it freaked me out, you know. I did this two weeks and <laughs> afterwards, you know, I was really craving for uh, Coke, yeah, and I really needed to drink this. And I mean, concerning, like, uh, if you talk to, to, to the Russian freedivers, they all drink Coca-Cola, you know. <laughs> so they say, like, this is their secret. Maybe that's the secret weapon, yeah. Yeah, that's the secret weapon, you know. I, I saw, I saw uh, some of them buying, like, a bunch of Coca-Cola. I was looking at them, what, you know, you're drinking this? And then they saw me buying a beer and they said, what, you're drinking this? You know, it's always uh, always the same, you know. I'm, I'm German, I need I need some some beer every time, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, it's, 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 I think it's, um, it's always the same. We have you have a theory about nutrition, and there is some proof about it. There is some some good things you know, like for example, take the complex uh, carbs. You know, like it would be better if dive uh, um, and eat at the right time, have a good timing for what you eat, uh, eat the right stuff at a certain time. I think this is very important. For example, in the morning, um, what I do now, I, I start eating something in the morning, so I eat watermelon. Uh, because you get hydrated at the same time, you get some sugar level uh, is going up, you know, but I don't eat much, you know, so I eat it after. And also, even if you eat it before switching, you can do that because it's very light. You know? It's very so light. It's, yeah. 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 So it's no problem. Um, so you actually you eat something before you dive. I started now. Yeah. Either bananas or uh, watermelon. Yeah. That's what I'm that's what I'm eating before that. I don't eat the oatmeal anymore. I hate it. Uh, after some time, you cannot eat it anymore. <laughs> like uh the oats um but i know many people who eat uh quick oats like uh, they make hot water and then quick oats and that's fine um that's definitely something good but it's just you know after some time you can't eat it anymore <laughs> i mean there are nice things you can eat like for example like what i always tell people when they ask me this question is uh try to eat something which is smart so that means after your dive like theoretically you should take antioxidants uh in freediving probably more than in many other sports but in many sports it's like this you need to take antioxidants it's very important for your cells so um eat something with antioxidants which goes fast into your body and which maybe also contains some good things which is good for freediving for example iron and with the iron you need vitamin c and uh, uh folate acid uh, folic acid so what you can do for example always use something local so what i what i do here i take a mango i take some pineapple and i take something called malangai also called moringa moringa has a lot okay, of yeah, uh, i've heard of that yeah it's 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 very healthy you know on the one side it's detox it's very good for detox it's it has a lot of iron it tastes it tastes not good. It tastes like grass. Uh, so the more you take, the more your smoothie will take like grass. It tastes like grass. So, you know, I mix all of this together and add a little bit of honey for the for the sweetness and drink it. You know, it's perfect. And maybe a banana also, you know. So and I think something like this is, is, is good, you know, because you, you, you can you can drink it very fast after your dive. It will digest very fast. And then maybe half an hour later, you can eat something properly. You know, it's like something with with uh, protein. 
also one very important thing I noticed is that um, like many freedivers, they lose a lot of weight, especially in deep freediving. It's uh, I I don't really know why. I my personal theory is because you, you you're not really moving so much. You know, you have maybe one deep dive. And uh, I thought maybe it has something to do with the breakfast because you're not really eating a proper breakfast. Um, but I also think it has something to do with your body itself. When, you, when you're deep diving, there's so much going on. It takes so much energy. And uh, I lost weight. I went from when I started serious free diving uh, in December 2015. From December 2015 to uh, I think it was May 2016 or June 2016. So it was around six months. I lose 12 kilo. Uh, oh, so that's I lost a lot. 12, 12, 12 kilo, you know. So I went from 72 kilo to 60 kilo. Wow. And um, I noticed that I also lost strength. And that was not good. So what I'm really trying to do all the time, and it's quite hard actually, to try to eat more and to try to eat a lot. And I start taking some some uh, supplements, you know. I take uh, protein shakes, uh, amino acids, um then there's, of course, there's also with the antioxidants, the same thing, you know, there are superfoods. I think they're maybe a little bit too overestimated, but you can have some some good stuff, you know, just add them, you know, like acai powder, for example. Cacao can be very nice. Uh, coffee, coffee is an interesting topic because there's some, some coffee divers and some non-coffee divers. And some people, they even drink in the morning, they eat, drink one coffee before they're diving, you know. Diving 100 meters and drink a coffee, you know. And that, when I started free diving, I thought, "What the fuck? You, you cannot do something like this, you know. Your heart rate will go." But that's actually okay, you know. Like your 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 blood system is is better with 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 uh, with, a, with a good coffee, you know. And if you are used to it, your heart rate will not go up. Maybe it's not a good thing to do a bit with the static, but you know, if you if you if you drink a coffee and then four hours later you dive, uh, it's not a big deal. Yeah, I think it depends a lot on the on the individual. I mean, uh, as far as I understand, even at a genetic level, at the genetic level, it will determine how you metabolize coffee. And for some Absolutely. people, that means it could be metabolized very quickly and gives them a really short, intense burst. And for some people, it might be 12 hours before the effects of the caffeine are out of the system. So it's very individual. And not even coffee. I think it's with many things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's why also it's such a. I think that's why this topic is so um, so different. You know, like many people have very different opinions on this. I know people who would smile. Well, probably when they listen to this, they would smile and think like, "Oh, come on, I eat whatever I like, and I can dive to eighty meters or whatever." You know. <laughs> I know also like a like a Chinese free diver, uh, Sendo Wang. He eats everything. You know, he could eat like a. <laughs> Like a like a like chips, you know, like like crisps, you know. Like he could eat everything before he go to the water, and he doesn't care at all. He could eat something super spicy in the day before. I would never do something like this. I would never eat something spicy. And I know on the next day I'm, I I want to dive, you know. And he doesn't care, and he's diving uh, nearly to 100 meters, you know. <laughs> It's amazing, though, but it's it's so different, and I think that's why, you know. Like um, I think you should always listen to your body. I think you should try to eat healthy if you can. So try to choose a healthy, healthy option if you can. Always think about: Do you have the? Do you have a good amount of 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 energy? Uh, do you have a good amount of protein? Um, do you have a good amount of of uh, vitamins and also of of uh, fats? So what I what I try to take with me every time is some almonds, some 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 nuts. So I I try to eat some nuts in between the meals. Just a little bit, you know, just a small snack. And I think the most important thing, if you really want to take this this topic serious, uh, the most important thing is to to actually take it serious, you know, to to also do it, to to remember to eat uh, certain things, you know, because if you want to have a optimal nutrition, you need to be, you need need to have discipline, you know. So, and often it's it's hard, you know, if you just want to relax and just not think about it, just have your, if you're busy with other things, then maybe you neglect that point a little bit. But yeah, so and for supplements, as I said, you know, like uh, there are some things which are maybe nice uh, with iron. You need to be a little bit careful that you're not taking too much mm -hmm. if you yeah. already add a lot of iron to your to your nutrition. Yeah, that's especially important for uh, for male free divers, um, as males. Oh, okay. Well, males cannot uh, males cannot remove iron from their system in the way that females can, 
of course, females have a certain time of the month when they are actually bleeding. And a oh, lot of iron right. comes out with that. So that, that is a, a major issue for some people. Actually. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's why it explains that uh, many women, they have uh, not enough iron in their blood. Right, right exactly. Yeah. yeah, Probably, yeah. So. Moving on to um, the future of free diving. How, how deep do you think we can go? I don't think that there's a true limit. I think that, you know, if you, if you just think about it, there's equalization can be a limit. Um, hypoxia can be a limit, but it's super hard to define them. Uh, so I think equalization is not really the point. People can equalize to very, very deep levels. You know, it's, that's not, that's, that will never be the problem. It's also a technical thing. You know, you can always improve technical things. Uh, so that's why I'm always saying like equalization is the easiest thing to fix. It's because it's a technical thing. Um, then you have, uh, hypoxia. You can also fix this because the better your technique is, the better your shape is, the, the more chances you have to dive deeper. The thing is, it will always be harder. So people cannot dive on that level all the time. So when people try to go for a world record, I think for them, it's like a thing that they have this kind of a good run, you know, like they are getting, they're in a good shape, they are trained and they are just having a peak moment where they can do this. They could not dive on this level for a long time. I think, I'm, I'm you know, I'm not a red record holder and I'm far away from this still, but uh, I think that's something which those people would uh, would sign or would, where they would say this this is true. I personally believe it, uh, that a limit, like a real limit, will be actually DCS. And that sounds strange first, but maybe I can explain. But DCS can be, especially like in, in free immersion, we saw cases where people have DCS, although they didn't do any repetitive dives, and they were breathing oxygen after the dive, and they still got DCS symptoms. And um, maybe this will be a limitation. So, so, so just imagine, you know, like take a certain amount of years. It doesn't matter. It can be, it can happen in 10 years, probably not, but maybe take 200 years, you know, and in 200 years, maybe the free immersion world record is like, I don't know, 145 or whatever. And uh, just thinking as an asymptotically, yeah. So just trying to think like how far it can go, where is the limit? And maybe people get too much DCS. And then people say, okay, sorry, this dive, this, 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 uh, kind of diving is getting too, too, uh, um, too dangerous. Too dangerous, right. Yeah. And we, we cannot do it anymore in this way, you know? Um, so that's what I would say. Like, there is actually not really a limit, but I could imagine that at some point of time, DCS could actually be a limit. But I think at the moment, we are still far away from this, right? So those cases are super rare. Um, it can be also very individual. So some people have more problems with DCS than others. Also, if you get this, this problem, you will have more problems in future. I heard at least. So, yeah. Best that we can do is, um, move slowly and learn from, uh, learn from, uh, from our community of free divers. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. And I think also, I personally think those cases, um, when they happen, they should be discussed and they should be published more. Like what I, what I, what I noticed a lot of times, and what I absolutely don't like is that um, many cases, many accidents, uh, when they happen, nobody knows about it and it's like a secret. And you need to think, you, it should be figured out and it should be kind of, you know, there should be like some kind of recommendations. And um, you should learn from those mistakes. So that's why, for example, I was, I was really shocked that um, after what happened in Cyprus with uh, Guillaume Neri, that uh, something like this, like with the line setting, happened again in Kalamata. So can you just explain to the to the listeners what that problem was? Yeah, well, in in in, um, in Cyprus, the line was set wrong. Yeah, it was a world record attempt by Guillaume Neri. He wanted to do uh, 129 meters, and it was set to 139 meters. So, and uh, what the so in 10 meters, of course, this is a lot. You know, this is like uh, not funny anymore. And um, what is the interesting thing is, like, first of all, the reason why it happened is that uh, a mark uh, fell off the rope. So there was like a, a mark for 150, uh, 130, and it looked like, uh, la- no, sorry, there was a mark for 140, and it looked like 130. 
So that's why they they put it on the steps because there was a the, like a like an electrical tape, you know, like it went off. So since this happens, you know, for example, like many people say, okay, don't use just electrical tape. At least use also a marker when you mark the rope. But then also this can be communication problems, you know, like uh, organizational problems. And when something like this happens, the it cannot be the case that you put like a this this. Uh, uh, like a like a like a committee which decides what will be how will we punish the how will we punish the judges there should be also a committee uh, who is deciding or who makes um the best out of this mistake and says okay how can we avoid this mistake what system do we need that this mistake will never happen again and ida definitely failed in this point definitely because it happened again in kalamata it shouldn't happen <laughs> I think you know, like I, I, uh, I was involved in organization of of competitions as well, and um, I can see it is something which still can happen when you are uh, busy, when there is a lot of things going on, when the conditions are bad, when you have a uh, stuff which is not working properly, you know, and when maybe one one guy has a lot of things to do at the same time. And in my opinion, that's what happened in Kalamata, you know. Like uh, the organizer, he had too many things to do at the same time, and they uh, set the wrong set the rope to the uh, to the wrong um, to the wrong depth. But they set it twice to the wrong depth. So first they set it to um, um, before me. So there were two divers. Actually, it happened to me, and it happened to a to another French diver called uh, Guillaume Prosser, and he was diving uh, before me. So he wanted to dive to 101 meter. But the line was set to uh, 81 meter because the starter. So there's in competition sometimes they take a starter so to check if everything is okay. And the starter was going to 81 meters, and they just forgot to set the line to 101. So Guillaume was doing the dive. So again, not Guillaume Navi, it was uh, another Guillaume, French Guillaume, and he was doing the dive, and he was doing the dive to an 81 meter coming up. He was super happy. Because he probably thought this what this was the easiest 101 meters ever. Yeah. So, and uh, I was going to that line, uh, and they changed the line. They they put it more up. I was announcing uh, 85 meters, and probably I don't know till today. I don't know exactly, but probably they put it to 65 meters. Uh, so I was diving down, and during my dive, I feel that the line is moving. So it was around 40 to 50 meters. I felt something is wrong with the line. And my first impression was, or my first thought was, okay, I'm not falling down. And I maybe I checked my weight. I put one hand to the weight. I saw, okay, my weight's on. Why, why I'm not falling down? Because the rope was going uh, faster than me, right? So you think, the moment you think you're not free falling. So I was actually moving. I was moving my, my, my monofin and I was kicking in 40, 50 meter steps. And then I still felt the line was was moving because I have all uh, in, in constant weight. I used to I don't do it anymore, but I used to have uh, uh, like my hand uh, on the line. I, I let it glide through my hand, so I felt it moving, and that was confusing me so much. I lost I lost the mouthfeel and I needed to turn. I was turning at uh, I think 57 meters, and I came up and uh, I received a yellow card, and nobody told me anything. There were two Ida judges. There was the organizer. There were um, judge helpers. Okay, they are new. They are, they, they, they are very unexperienced. But nobody told me anything. And I was going off the line and I thought, okay, I fucked it. I, I did a mistake. And I was super angry and super sad, you know, like because I it was, it was, it was team world championship and I thought, oh shit, you know, I, I needed to get those points for my team. And uh, luckily I had a coach. And my coach came to me, and usually I don't have a coach. Normally I don't dive without a coach. And my coach told me, like, do you want to protest? Like it was a minute or two minutes later, you know. She said, oh, do you want to protest? And I said, like, why, why should I protest? Uh, yeah, they. I'm not sure, but they, they set the line during a dive. Can you protest when you do this? I said, of course. <laughs> I went I went to the judge and I said, I want to protest. And it was like, a, I, I don't know, 20 seconds later, they said, okay, it's fine. You can do a redive and you can dive again in one hour. Uh, which is, of course, which is not so nice, you know, but uh, still I had the chance. But for Guillaume, for the diver uh, before me, they didn't tell him at all, you know. They they, they told 
they told him like at the evening they told him like yeah uh, actually we did a mistake and so on you know he noticed it during you know because of course he has a computer so he noticed it sometime later but he didn't have the chance to to prove it again you know he didn't have the chance to to do the redive so he was uh, he they, they they gave him of course they gave him a 101 points uh, for the 101 meters although he achieved 81 but it's not a nice feeling to get this you know of course and at the same time you go there uh, to the world championships and you are practicing so much you know you spend so much time in training you spend so much money for one dive and he was particularly I, I knew about the story later because uh, another French diver told me uh, he was training for exactly this dive uh, the whole year <laughs> And then you know it gets it gets uh, fucked up because uh, because the judges are setting it wrong. And I'm not really you know the organizer came uh, immediately. He came to me and he said, uh, "Tim, I'm super sorry. It was my mistake. I I was too busy. I was uh, I was doing a mistake, you know." And I said, "Okay, you know it's fine." Um, the judges they didn't they didn't apologize at all. They didn't come and say sorry, you know. <laughs> Like I mean, uh, they they are responsible for for uh, giving a go on the line, you know. So what we were doing when we were uh, organizing competitions here, I was working at the last uh, at the last big competition here. I was working as a chief of safety, so I was responsible for the safety. What we were doing, we were working with protocols. We were saying when the lanyard is on, we were saying lanyard on, and one of the judges needs to say lanyard on. There are two people need to confirm that the lanyard is on, and two people need to confirm that the depth is on the right depth. Yeah. So there's a judge. He can see the he can see the mark. I can see the mark as a safety, and I check the marks again in depth. So I dive down. I take my computer, check it. I come up and say I'm okay. Uh, say say it's okay. You know. So um, you need to have like some kind of this protocols. You know. You need to have a system. Yeah. It's it is it should be obvious, super obvious. Yeah. And I, I have absolutely no idea why for uh, something like a world championship, why there is not some I can you know. There's always when you want to organize uh, competitions. I can always understand. Sometimes it's hard. You need to. You ne you don't maybe don't have the capacity to do everything, and mistakes can happen. So you always should leave a little bit of of um, you know. You should always make it a little bit easy also for the for the for the um, for the organizer not to make it too difficult. So that even something like this can be organized, like freediving competitions. But, I mean, for world championships, it should be really not happening, you know. Like, there should be really a system. It is it is possible to, to avoid those risks, you know. It's not like a, not like an impossible thing, you know. Like, those, there, are, there are risks which are, not, which are impo impossible to avoid, but there are risks which you can avoid and you need to avoid. Yeah, those are easily risks. avoidable risks. And I think that, you know, hopefully that yeah. will be something that's addressed in the coming years as... As the popularity of free diving increases and there's more media attention, um, hopefully that will change. Absolutely. Yeah. So you spend a lot of time in the water. Um, I'm sure you've noticed on some of your dives, if not even on most most of the time in the water, you see a lot of plastic in the water. You see other things, other trash. What is your uh, what is your thoughts on the state of the oceans at the moment and? Uh, what do you think we can do to help with this problem, which is seems to be really getting out of control at the moment? Yeah, it's it's terrible. I mean, if you look at the um, the amount of plastic in the water, and if you see the statistics, you know, you never you never know if the statistics are right, you know. But um, if you see it, and especially here in Panglao in the Philippines, you can see it very often that, you, that there's plastic in the water. I always tell my students, you know, like that there's one slide in in um, in the IDA uh, material, and it says like uh, how you should behave when you're in the water, and it says don't take anything out, don't leave anything behind, and I always say don't take anything out except of the plastic, you know, like if you see something and it floats by, just take it out, put it on the boat, or take it to the shore, put it in a bin, you know, <sighs> you know, like the very hard thing is, especially in poor countries, you have a lot of problems, you have you have the fact that it's the same thing with the with the fishing, you know. Like uh, when you see like what the people are fishing, like for example here in Panglao, you had like a we had a, a um, like a how do you call it again? I forgot the word. The small fishes they come in swarms, sardines. We had a sardine swarm here, very nice sardine swarm. Out of a sudden they were gone, 
And we were like thinking, okay, what did they do? Was it because of the temperature? Was it because of too much noise? Because there were like uh, people jumping into the water uh, near 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 the spot. But we can also imagine, you know, somebody just came and uh, just fished them away, you know, because uh, uh, they can make a lot of money and they are so poor, you know, the people. So it is the same, you know, if you, if you do something like this, it's always, there's always a degree of understanding and do I have the ability to, to take this as a problem, you know, for myself, like for us, like mostly like academic people, people who have no big problems in their lives, you know, no huge problems with money, you know, we can always easily say, okay, we need to be aware. Don't put any anything in the in the in the ocean. You know, no plastic. Of course, for us, it's obvious. For poor people, it's sometimes a little bit hard to understand why this is a problem. You know, because they have different. They have they have much huger yeah, problems their for priorities themselves. Are different. Yeah, exactly, they have different priorities. They and I think this is a very difficult thing. So. The, the most difficult challenge is to make it possible that those people can live their lives, especially also the fishermen, exactly the same thing, that they can live their lives properly or that they get substituted in a way, you know. And this is where, for example, like uh, uh, this kind of uh, eco-tourism can really work, you know, like that you have um, – um, that people are coming and uh, – they spend a lot of money at some certain place where you can see the environment and that, you know, that the locals get parts of this, you know, that you, that they get a win situation of this. And this is very important. And, um, you know, I see also very, very nice examples here in the Philippines. Let me tell you one thing. There's uh, like, uh, I live in Panglao. That's uh, Visayas. It's like in the, in the middle of, uh, of the Philippines. Uh, it's connected to a big island called Bohol. And uh, if you go a little bit, you know, like maybe I would say a hundred, no, not even a hundred kilometers, I think maybe 80 kilometers in the east of this island, there's a small island called Kamigen. And if you go there, um, there's no plastic allowed. So um, they don't, when you go to the supermarket, they don't give you a plastic bag. They give you um, a paper, like newspaper. They put everything in newspaper and give it to you like this. You are not allowed to take any plastic. They even have points uh, there, like uh, spots, like air, whole areas on the island where you are not allowed to smoke, you know. And this is like a kind of project where uh, they say, okay, let's see how tourists are reacting on this. And of course, people like this, you know, people go there and they, they love it. You know, they see, okay, everything is super clean. You know, if you go to the road, there's nothing there. There's no, no rubbish, nothing. Like if I compare it with Bali, for example, Bali is like, oh, there's so much rubbish, you know, so much lit. It's, it's, it's terrible. You know, like here in Panglao, it's not like this much cleaner, but still you can see plastic somewhere, you know, like people put their, put their, uh, rubbish somewhere, but, uh, it's not so bad. And if you go to come again, it's like, it's like clean. It's like paradise, you know. And I think it will take some time. But the biggest challenge is to to at those places where we have the nice reefs, where the, where we have the tourism. Um, the locals need to benefit from this. They need to change this. They are a huge factor for this. But they also need to have the benefit. If they don't have it, they don't see a point in doing this, you know. Yeah, the local the incentive for the local population has to be a, a lot more than it is now. So let me just ask a few questions, just a few fun questions. Um, do you have a do you have a ritual in the morning? Do you is there something that you do every morning, or is it just kind of a different every day? Um, no, it's not really different every day, but I, I'm changing it from time to time. Let's say it like this: what I do at the moment is uh, I stand up, I stretch my body a little bit. You know, not 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 the lungs anymore. I stopped uh, lung stretching now, so that's my new approach to. <laughs> to uh to stop squeezing you know to go into the water with a fresh lung if i do lung stretching i would do it in in a on a day off or when i have a long time no no um no diving you know um but in the morning before dive i would uh, stretch my body i especially try to stretch those places where i feel unflexible so that's for example my lower back and my legs i try to stretch them more and more and i feel also improvements every morning you know um what I do then is trying to prepare mentally for the dive. So I explained it already before a little bit with the Udayana Banda. You know, I do Udayana Banda many times. 
I do this until I get my first contraction. And then I would, when I get those contraction, I do the movement of the, I, I stand in front of a mirror, mirror and I do the movement which I'm doing in the water. So if I do free immersion, I would do free pulls in the, in the air, you know. If I do no fins, I do, I do a, a, an arm stroke. And I always try to time the contraction in my most, um, in the best position. You know what I mean? So I would, I, I don't want to have the contraction when I'm just about doing the arm stroke and stretching my arms. This is very bad timing for the contraction. I want to have the contract, contraction when my arms are down. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm getting the contractions and I'm timing them with the movement I'm doing. So I see the benefit that I'm visualizing my dive, doing the movement, I'm visualizing the movement, and I'm actually um, getting mentally prepared for um, uh, for the urge to breathe. Because, I mean, you can test it. You can, uh, I, I don't know if you ever did it, but uh, do a full exhale suddenly, do a full exhale and hold your breath. And it's a terrible feeling when the contraction come. I mean, it's 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 not as easy as when you have a full breath. Yeah, so it's it's always my my training. You know, I try to make it a little bit hard, and then usually the second or third time I do it, it's fine. You know, so I do it like three to four times, and then it's fine. You know, then I'm kind of confident. Uh, I, I also I think that's a good 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 thing for avoiding uh, deep contractions. Uh, or like bad contractions, you know, so that's something I'm working on right now. So this is basically my routine. And uh, if, when I'm finished with this, I uh, I do, I, I eat something. So as I said, I usually eat some watermelon or some, 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 uh, uh, some bananas. And sometimes or mostly I also go into the shower and I take a shower before I dive because I just uh, don't like the feeling to get into the suit like dirty, you know, and, um, I try to, uh, how do you say, I, you know, I, I, I just feel more fresh and I feel yeah. more awake. I think that also more, might have know? a little, uh, give you a psychological advantage as well. Exactly. And also, you know, like in warm places, like on the Philippines, you know, you, you're sweating during the night much more. And yeah, also I, I try to keep hydrated as, as good as possible. So I drink a lot of water before I dive. Do, do you have a long-term plan? Do you have any uh, aspirations or dreams for the future beyond freediving or involving freediving? Um, actually, I'm you know I'm at the moment I'm 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 diving quite a lot. So I'm I was studying until until uh, December 2015, and then I said okay, I want to have uh, some time off for freediving, like uh, one to one and a half years, and. So now it's already quite a long time. So I consider to have a break soon, just a little bit. You know, I also want to use my use the things I study, use the knowledge, and do some uh, uh, do some work in that field. You know, to to work in finance. I want to go to to Hong Kong and to start working there. I really like that that city. But uh, luckily, they have uh, they have free diving clubs there, so I can I can still do free diving. And I would never stop competitive freediving, you know, but maybe I need like a, like a little break. So I cannot do so many competitions anymore. I used to do like uh, three competitions, five, co uh, three to five competitions a year. Um, so maybe next year will be a little bit more calm. Um, but then of course I, I would always like to grow in that sport and I would always like to, to, to do improvements. So I'm definitely happy to join uh, uh, Vertigo Blue again, for example. So I consider maybe next year just do the Vertigo Blue, nothing else. But uh, let's see. Um, yeah, my, I mean, I, I cannot say my main goal is not to, to break the world record. You know, it's so far away. And it's, uh, I mean, the, the national records were already very nice, you know. So, um, but... Of course, you have also the number 100 meters. You have it in your mind a little bit, but I don't want to be. Um, I don't want to be. I want. I don't want to focus on the numbers too much, you know. So, for example, many people tell me like, "Oh, do you want to do the 100 meters?" And I say, "I do the 100 meters when they come, you know. When there's the right time to do it, then I will do it. At the moment, it's not the right time. I don't feel ready for it, so I still need to uh, to do a little bit to 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 feel ready for the 100 meters." Um, and I, 
I want to do 100 meters, not just like, okay, it happened because I had a good run. You know? I want to do the 100 meters and be convinced that I can do it again. Yeah, you want to be able to uh, to to reach 100 meters and then be able to own 100 meters and return there when you, whenever you want. Yeah, exactly. So I want to do that dive again if I can. Yeah, so... And it's different, you know, some people, they can, you know, they, I know, I know one guy, he did 90 meters PB, 95 meters PB, 100 meters PB. This was his step in two weeks. <laughs> so um, for him, for sure, I know he cannot do 100 meters just like this the next time he's diving because that was quite lucky, I would say, you know. So I don't want to do it this way because especially also uh, because of my lungs, you know, just do it properly. I would not like to do it and have a lung squeeze, you know. <laughs> so I would like to do it and come out and feel fine, you know. That's why also uh, at the World to Get Blue, when I came up after 93 meters, I knew exactly I squeezed, you know. I know it from the first breath I took. Uh, everybody was cheering, you know, giving me the white card. And I, I really couldn't celebrate it so much, you know. I was just like, uh, you know, shit, I squeezed, you know. I, I probably I cannot uh, continue diving here. So, and it's also not, it doesn't feel so nice, you know, so, so that's, that's, that's always, that's my first philosophy about freediving, about progress, you know, just make it in a healthy way and it needs to feel good. And also what I learned from, from, uh, from my buddy here, like, uh, Alenka Artnik, like the world record holder in Bifins, I saw it so much on her, you know, she's always diving in her comfort zone. And that's why every dive from her looks so easy, you know, even if she's diving to 94 meters, it looks very easy for her because she enjoys the dive and she feels like this dive is still okay for her, you know. Of course, it's it's some work, but it is, it's feeling nice, you know. It's not feeling too difficult. And I always want to keep this also for my diving. Yeah, I think that's incredibly important advice to give all free divers to make sure the diving is still uh, a pleasurable experience and makes them happy and feels good every time they go on the water. Definitely. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, in competitive free diving, you have some goals, you, you think you need to push yourself, even if it's not dangerous, you know, it can start making, uh, making your mind, you know, like that you get mind issues. <laughs> then you take it too serious and you go deeper and deeper and deeper every time. And in between, you know, you should take some, some yeah, easy You go dives. down the rabbit hole a little so, bit at some point. Exactly. So what I'm doing, for example, now I'm, 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 I'm doing free immersion. I'm, uh, focusing a little bit more on free immersion at the moment for the next, uh, three weeks, but I will do some no fence dive in between just to have some shallower dives to keep up that level. Uh, and I will also do some dives with the monofin, but I will do them much shallower. I will not, when I do 85, uh, free immersion, I will not do 85 constant weight in the same day at, at the next day. You know, I, I would go down and I will do something shallower that I have a fun dive, you know, uh, and I, that so that I'm not going into the water and thinking like, okay, I need to do the same depth, but with the monofin. So let's see how it is. I don't know, you know, and then, then your mind starts making troubles, you know, so uh, it's always better to stay in the comfort zone for, for sure. And that's, that's definitely what helps, you know, that helps with the equalization, that helps with your relaxation and the depth. So also for the, for the, for the, um, for the bowel trauma and the lungs, you know, it's always better to 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 be to go like this. And uh, the big competition is coming up in Roatan in a few weeks. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I know you're trying to raise some funds to get you there. So if someone uh, if someone listens to the podcast and they want to help you out with that, how would they go about it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I I did I did uh, I started a crowdfunding. So I was, you know, I was really hesitating about that because, you know, you're asking people for money, you know, and it's, it kind of doesn't feel so nice and, oh, you know, like it's, it's hard, but, you know, I, I did it because it was simply, okay, I had the choice. I either work and uh, maybe get the money a little bit, you know, I'm probably not all of it, but I wouldn't have any time to train at all, you know, and then it's kind of senseless, you know, you, you cannot go there. Or you start a crowdfunding and uh, try to find it, uh, or try to find sponsors. You know, you can go this way. And um, with the sponsors, I mean, I have uh, sponsors for material, but not for the, not for money. You know, not yet. So uh, the only way I saw to keep the training up and uh, to concentrate, focus on on my training, was to start crowdfunding. And it works quite nice. You know, like the people who 
who give me money you know i don't have the feeling you know i really ask them you know they really want to give me money because they they like what i do and they um they want to support me and uh it's it's very nice i was i was amazed by by the number of people and especially like some people gave me uh, quite a huge amount of money i was really surprised you know so now it's still running i think 18 days and i'm at around 50 percent of the of the goal yeah that's 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 okay and i also found i also found some some other uh points where i can maybe finance a little bit and also i found i found not such an expensive flight which i thought you know so it was a little bit more cheaper so even if i don't hit 100 percent, so even if i hit like maybe 80 percent, 75 it will be completely fine you know so and i'm super grateful that uh that people um uh give me some money or like that they, that they that, especially also you know i i'm i'm um I'm offering some stuff, you know, so it's not like some people, they, they, they booked, for example, like a Skype session. So I would like for 65 euro, you can, you can book a Skype session and you can, um, we would talk before we would, we would talk about a certain topic. So they can tell me the problem, you know, they can tell me, okay, listen, I'm diving 40 meters and I'm having this and this issue. Can we talk about this? You know, and, uh, I, feel experienced enough to to definitely help and to definitely whatever topic it is you know to to do something so i would take that topic i would prepare something have a skype session talk to the person like one to two hours and then create like a kind of list you know like the things which we need to do to improve uh that thing you know and keep up the communication to to see how it is you know to coach a little bit from from far away so if someone if someone would like to take you up on the offer or if they would just like to make a donation where, where can they go to do that uh they can go on the website makeachamp.com and they just need to type in my name timothy ermigan or they can just go on my facebook page uh timothy ermigan uh freediver and there they they see it like the the, the first post I, I pinned it, uh, like a link to 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 this post, and uh, they just they can just follow the link, give a donation if they like, or book like a like a um, like one of the things I offer, like for example, also the, the the bestseller is the postcard. You know, I have very beautiful pictures from Dan Verhoeven from uh, from uh, the Vertigo Blue, so I will create some postcards and send some postcards for 20 euro uh, i think that's quite nice and yeah so i'll uh, for those who are listening i'll put all those links in the show notes for this episode so you can get to them straight away so um i just want to ask you one more question uh can you recommend a book or do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to people oh yeah definitely <laughs> i mean at the moment actually at the moment i'm uh i'm reading um one breath about nick mevol is dead Death. I uh, I started it yesterday. It's quite funny because they talk a lot about a lot of people I know, so it's uh, quite interesting. Like uh, if if I imagine I don't know those people, like how he describes them, it's funny. But nevertheless, one book I really recommend, uh, which is nice, is uh, it called uh, The Swarm. It's a German uh, it's a German book, but it's a, it's a bestseller. They translated in so many uh, so many languages. And it's really interesting if you are interested in um, if you're interested in marine life, if you're interested in freediving, and if you are also if you have a fable for uh, for uh, science fiction. If you like science fiction, it's nice because it's a, a little bit uh, sci-fi. So it's uh, it, it starts like a realistic life, you know, in 2015 or whatever. Uh, but there is something going wrong with the oceans, you know, like some like people disappear, boats disappear suddenly, like, uh, like in the Bermuda uh, Triangle, you know, and they talk about a lot of very interesting scientific facts, actually. So it's really nice. Uh, it's it's really well researched. The author did a very good job on the research. So it's actually a lot of things. Frank Schätzing is the author. And the uh, um, Uma Thurman, like the, the the actor who is very famous from Pulp Fiction, like she uh, she actually she um, bought the, the the film rights the so to the, because they want to make a movie out of it. If it kind of combines science fiction with the ocean and a bit of free diving, then that's pretty much perfect for me. Yeah, it's a it's a little bit like uh, there's this one science fiction movie where they find some alien mothership in the depths. Well, I, I forgot the name. Uh, uh, Abyss. Abyss. Exactly. The Abyss by James Cameron. Exactly. Right? It's a little bit like the Abyss. Perfect. 
Perfect. So everyone should go out and read it before Uma Thurman makes a movie about it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay, Tim, um, it's been really fantastic. Um, I learned so much from this interview. And thank you so much for coming on and being the first guest. It's just... Uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm uh, really, really curious who will uh, talk after me. I will definitely listen to it. They're very nice. Uh, there are people that can they can tell you so many stories, and it would be so extremely interesting to listen to it. Yeah, that's that's very nice. I mean, like as you said, the format is really nice. So uh, what I always have troubles with, like what I noticed in, in Germany when I had some TV appointments, uh, they make it very very short, and they need to put in this complex topic in like two minutes, you know. Or like one time I was like on a live interview for eight minutes. It was impossible to talk about this topic in eight minutes uh, appropriately, you know. So um, <laughs> I needed to 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 make it very short. And if you have a long, for example, compared, if you have a long radio interview, like uh, half an hour to one hour, it's much nicer, you know. You can talk so much more. Yeah, well, I can guarantee that guests on the on the free dive cafe can always talk for as long as they want. So. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Tim, thanks very much. Um, I'll say goodbye now, and um, hopefully we can, uh, we can do this again some yeah, other time. Yeah, thank you very much. Dive safe. So that was Tim Umegan. Thank you so much to Tim for making this first episode such a good one. When I envisioned the Freedive Cafe podcast, this is exactly the kind of show I had in mind. If you want to get in touch with Tim or contribute to his crowdfunding campaign, you can find links to his pages at freedivecafe.com slash Tim. There should be a couple more episodes out this week. After that, starting on around the 15th of July, I should be releasing a new episode every two weeks if possible. Remember to subscribe to the show through your favorite podcast provider so you don't miss the show and share the Free Dive Cafe with your friends. Until next time, dive safe.